Hello everyone, I'm Beth Folsom and I'm the program manager here at History Cambridge. Um, before we begin tonight, I'd like to acknowledge that our headquarters at the Hooper Lee Nichols House um, on Brattle Street in Cambridge sits on the traditional land of the Massachusetts people. Welcome to our program. Um, I'd like to start by asking you all to identify yourselves in the chat box so that we can get a sense of who is on the call. Um, go ahead and drop that in the chat when you have a chance. And a reminder that you can use the chat box to ask questions throughout the program. I'd like to extend a special thank you and welcome to the Friends of History Cambridge who have made tonight's event possible. If you'd like to consider joining our group, head over to our website, which is historycambridge.org and click on the support button at the top of the page. And I'll be dropping that link in the chat in just a second. This program is also funded in part by the Massachusetts Society of Cincinnati and we thank them for their support. You can also sign up to receive our e-news so that you don't miss out on great future events like these. And a reminder that tonight's event is free, but donations are of course, always welcome. And a big thank you to many of you who made a donation for tonight's program. We really appreciate it. And after tonight's event, you'll be receiving a survey asking you how you liked it. Please fill it out. It helps us a lot. Um, we're always looking for feedback um, and ways to make our programs even more um, relevant and more um, uh, educational and uh, accessible to everyone. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, our fabulous intern, Betsy Dunham. Thank you very much. Yes, so I'm an intern at History Cambridge this spring. Um, and so I have been looking at Fort Washington Park and this is the first of three events that I'm putting together with Rika and Beth and Talia and everybody um, that is looking at Fort Washington Park and sort of the history of it and how it's used now and how, to, how it will evolve. And so this event is looking at the history. And so we have four different people or five, including myself, that will each cover a different part of the history. And then we have another event on May 20th that's actually in the park itself, um, where we're hoping that Cambridge Port residents will come and sort of chat with us about what they use the park for, what they'd like to see sort of in the future happen with it and things like that, and what they sort of know about the history. And then we'll be having a third event later in June that will cover um, sort of, a, it'll be like an overview of everything that we've learned and what we're hoping to sort of see going forward after that. Um, so I'll start screen sharing so you can see sort of the agenda and I'll introduce that and then start with the speakers. So let me screen share. All right. Everyone can see that. So, this is just, um, so we'll be there. Will be five of us talking about a different um, like era of history that of Fort Washington and Cambridge Port. So Sage Carbone is an indigenous scholar. We'll be talking about sort of the indigenous time period before pre-colonization. Then Emily Levine from the Longfellow House Washington headquarters will be talking about Revolutionary War era. Charlie Sullivan from the Cambridge Historical Society be talking about post-revolution sort of like 1800s eras I'll be talking about um the sort of like early 1900s era and then Madeline Lord is here from um who's a local artist who will be talking about the sculptures that are in the park itself and then we'll have sort of a closing thoughts and questions um point at the end so I will hand it over to Sage we'll talk the indigenous history and I'll stop screen sharing so then Sage will be up. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks Betsy. Hi everybody. Oh. My name is Sage Carbone. I live just on the corner between Kendall Square and East Cambridge and I'm a member of the Northern Narragansett tribe uh, of Rhode Island and I also have uh, Nipmuc, Micmac, and Massachusetts uh, ancestry as well. So thanks for having me here today and um, hope you enjoy. What we now know as the Cambridge Port neighborhood is located on the traditional homelands of the Massachusetts tribe whose descendants still live here. 
I'd like to thank History Cambridge for the opportunity to speak with you today and also invite you to learn more about the Indigenous history of Cambridge at next week's History Cafe. Cambridge Port includes a number of places that have been in use since prior to colonization. Putnam Avenue was known as Wig Wigwam Neck in early maps, where Indigenous peoples lived seasonally along the Charles River, then known as the Kennebecuan, in order to fish along its plentiful banks on the west side. Lafayette Square had been an oyster marketplace with a closer proximity to the waterways than by today's geography. The land we now call Cambridge, formerly known as Newtown and for millennia as Enmokagan, was purchased from Sachem Squaw of Mystic for 21 coats, 19 fathom of wampum, and three bushels of corn. For many people, the narrative of Native American, American Indian, Indigenous cultures, of which hundreds of recognized and unrecognized tribal nations across the colonial borders of Turtle Island was dictated by a group called the Improved Order of Redmen, whose membership consisted of, ironically, only white men. The Improved Order of Redmen have their origins in the Sons of Liberty, whose members famously dressed as Native Americans to disguise their appearances while committing the Boston Tea Party. At least three presidents were members, Warren G. Harding, Theodore Roosevelt, and Franklin D. Roosevelt. Similar organizations, including the Improved Order of Red Men, all meeting in Cambridge, were also the Mineola Council for the Daughters of Pocahontas, Niagara Tribe, Panama Tribe, and the Indian Rights Association. Meeting of the Massachusetts tribe, as you can see the difference, Massachusetts versus Massachusetts tribe, for the improved order of red men, first took place May 19th, 1903 on Prospect Street and lasted through about 1922. Aside from the adoption of quote, pale faces into roles such as sachem and wampum keeper, the improved order of red men used a calendar that began in 1492 upon the so-called discovery of America by Christopher Columbus, hosted art exhibitions from Western tribes, met with legitimate American Indian organizations, and they also raised money for residential schools. These funding efforts were seen as admirable practice. Students participated in the equivalent of a one-way cultural exchange program that would civilize them through faith-based education. The purpose of residential schools was, and still is, to kill the Indian in him and save the man. Harvard Indian College was amongst the first established residential schools, which also included the Carlisle School in Pennsylvania, famous for Olympian Jim Thorpe. There were regular Cambridge newspaper articles to highlight the economic and social viability of institutionalizing Native children. The Cambridge Indian Association published this note from their 1887 meeting. Miss Carter had met with a lady who gave up trying to help the Indians because two young men from the Carlisle School had been seen taking part in a war dance with paint and feathers after the old style. These poor fellows, however, had been only two years at school. And is it strange that they would sometimes fall back into barbarianism? Let us try and aid them in every way we can and stimulate their best ambitions. Another headline from the Cambridge Chronicle in 1916 read, the poor low is now the busy low touting that 261 male students made nearly a million dollars in today's wages, with the highest percentage working at the Ford factory. As of this date, the remains of over 400 children have been discovered at residential schools across the United States, and there are countless others in academic archives. We also know that the Ford Motor Company is currently being sued by the state of New Jersey for decades of illegal dumping of toxic waste into the Ramapo Lenape reservation area, which poisoned the people. Cambridgeport is no stranger to the environmental destruction of its water. Today, the pollution into the Charles River 
the recent discovery of PFAS, and the commodification of drinking sources by major corporations disproportionately affect urban residents like the ones living in this neighborhood. The history of indigenous peoples in this area is complicated, and I hope that this overview today can provide some insight into how the current landscape of where we lived has been shaped by colonization. To acknowledge that indigenous people still live here and to encourage you to bring those perspectives into your community conversations. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Sage. It's a very good sort of background for what um, the land is and the space is that then we'll be talking about further. So I will share my screen and then, oh, and if anybody has any questions for Sage as well, we're gonna have questions at the end, but if um, we also have an event next week that um, looks at sort of further into the indigenous history. So keep an eye out for that, but also if you have any questions throughout, you can put them in the chat and we'll um, have everything at the end as well. Um, so I will share my screen and then Emily can pick up with the next section. All right, so here's my little, all right. So if Emily is ready, I can start first screen. Great, thank Everybody, you. So oh, sorry. Oh, can you can you hear me? I can see the, the slide. Great. All right. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for being here. Um, thanks to the other speakers. Thanks to History Cambridge for um, in the invitation to share a little bit with you this evening. I'm going to be offering a few visual descriptions for accessibility throughout the presentation. So I'll start with myself. I am a white woman in my mid 30s um, wearing a National Park Ranger uniform. Um, and behind me is a Zoom background of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's very red very um, Victorian book filled study. So um, I'm going to talk briefly about Washington's nine months in Cambridge as context for the construction of the three gun battery now called Fort Washington, um, and a few of the complexities of Cambridge in this early so called founding era. So what you see on the screen is an image of Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters as it sits today. It's a yellow 18th century Georgian mansion with dark green shutters and large porches surrounded by a green lawn. And I hope that many of you have had the chance to visit us. Um, either way, please stop by during our open season, which starts on May 26th. <clears throat> Excuse me, so today we have named the historic site after its two most famous residents, George Washington, and then the poet Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but many people have occupied this space throughout its 264 year history, including the, the brief nine month period when it served as Washington's headquarters. Um, you can head to the next slide. So this is gonna to transition to a rendering of how the house likely looked during the 18th century. It has gray paint. It has no shutters or porches. You can click again. Um, this will fade and three silhouettes will appear. Um, one depicts an enslaved woman in the late 18th century wearing a long skirt and holding a child's hand. The other depicts an enslaved man shouldering a garden hoe. And these images come from a series commissioned by Mount Vernon, uh, but no images of the individuals enslaved here on Brattle Street are believed to exist specifically. Um, you also see a portrait of George Washington in a military uniform by Charles Wilson Peel on this slide. Um, so when Washington arrived at his Cambridge headquarters on Brattle Street in the summer of 1775, a small community of formerly enslaved people were already living on that property. Um, several years prior in 1759, their enslaver John Vassal um, had built this grand Georgian style mansion along the road to Watertown, now again Brattle Street. He enslaved Cuba, Dinah, Malcolm, William, and three children, James and two quote unquote, small boys whose names are no longer known. Um, but in late 1774, John Vassal, who was a loyalist, fled Cambridge very abruptly following the powder alarm of September. Uh, he left behind the people who he had enslaved and uh, with their enslavers gone, we know that Cuba reunited her family in freedom on a portion, portion of her former enslaver's estate, um, farming alongside her family and laboring for themselves uh, for the next seven years. And they would soon become part of a very sudden community of soldiers, generals, aides, um, enslaved people from Mount Vernon, free laborers, and visiting dignitaries, all part of George Washington's headquarters. 
Um, by April of 1775, of course, armed conflict had broken out at Lexington and Concord. This is your little Revolutionary War refresher um, and the Patriot militias mobilized. June of that year saw the Battle of Bunker Hill. And in July, this former vassal mansion became the headquarters of George Washington, now the commander of the Continental Army. So understanding Washington's time in Cambridge can really help us to grapple with a few enduring questions about leadership and liberty during this, uh, this era. Um, here in Cambridge, Washington took the national stage for the first time uh, in the early fight for American independence. In this house, um, even the first written instance, the first known written instance of the phrase United States of America uh, was penned by one of Washington's aides. And you can click and we'll actually see that written down here in a document from early 1776. Um, and when Washington arrived at his Cambridge headquarters, he enslaved over 130 people on his Virginia plantation, several of whom he brought with him to Cambridge. Um, Washington himself was a lifelong enslaver. That is a key fact of his life. And to his view, it didn't necessarily represent a paradox. So to George Washington, freedom and citizenship during this period were really for white Americans. So how did Washington come to Cambridge and what did he do here, especially with regards to the fort? Um, let's transition again. So this slide shows an imaginative courier in Ives print of Washington taking command of the army on the Cambridge Common. He's on a horse under a tree faced by hundreds of orderly white soldiers with bayonets. So June 75, he's uh, appointed commander in chief of the Continental Army by the Continental Congress. July 2nd, a 43 year old Washington arrives in Cambridge and assumes command. And a couple weeks later, he moves into the house. Next slide. Now you can get an even better look at the study that's also behind me um, alongside a, um, a portrait of George Washington with a white horse. This is the room uh, where Washington made his key decisions, we believe. Again, we don't have any of his furnishings left in the house today, but this room was his war council chamber. And the next slide. I'm sorry if you can hear a crying toddler in the background. Um, this slide shows a chaotic scene depicting the Battle of Bunker Hill. This scene was painted in 1866, so a little bit out of the period. Um, but the first American troops who uh, surrounding Boston were militia regiment, regiments. These are the troops that Washington came to command. Uh, historian John Bell, some of you may know, describes them as part-time soldiers, 16 to 60, assembling for emergency duty. So by late May of 1775, the combined New England army in the field numbered about 16,000 men. And Washington was very concerned about the state of the army when he arrived. Uh, he wrote, uh, among many other things, quote, their spirit has exceeded their strength here in Massachusetts. All right, next slide. So the task facing Washington here was to create a more unified sort of disciplined fighting force. Um, you see on the, the screen here, a quote from his first major general orders, where he announced that these Patriot militias are now the troops of the United Provinces of North America, and it is hoped that all distinctions of colonies will be laid aside so that one and the same spirit may animate the whole. Uh, and then he says it is required and expected that exact discipline be observed and due subordination prevail. So click. Um, you're going to see a drawing of four Patriot soldiers up here, as well as a more modern illustration um, of a Black Continental Army soldier. Um, so sanitation and behavior were big for George Washington. He issued a whole bunch of general orders, you know, requiring church attendance. He forbid skinny dipping in plain sight of the citizens of Cambridge. He uh, tried to promote uniformity in dress. He said no gambling. And he also promoted military hierarchy and emphasized again, national unity. Um, in one key decision, Washington and the Continental Congress barred black soldiers from the army. Um, shortly afterwards, George Washington reversed the decision in response to the protests of those soldiers, um, as well as an enlistment crisis. Okay, next slide. So now we're going to get down to Fort Washington, um, and we'll be done in just a moment. But this is a late 18th century map depicting Greater Boston's military fortifications in 1775 and 76. And we'll now zoom in to Cambridge. We're going to reorient the map to roughly north south, and you can click again. All right, so to get oriented, um, so the circle on the left is says Colonel Vassal, that's the headquarters, the now the Longfellow House. 
Uh, if you go just a little bit to the right, you'd see the Cambridge Common and then Harvard College. And then the two circles down on the right side of the slide are two three-gun batteries, um, likely including the current site of Fort Washington. So soon after Washington arrived at his Cambridge headquarters, the army began just a burst of fortification building. They were worried about another British initiative um, offensive out of Boston, especially along the Charles River. So they constructed basic fortifications at Prospect Hill, Winter Hill, um, in Roxbury as well. And then they went back and fortified some secondary strategic locations, um, completing what is now Fort Washington and Cambridge in November 1775, as Washington noted just before the ground froze. Um, and Washington was directly very involved in this process. In late November, he wrote, quote, I have caused two half moon batteries to be thrown up for occasional use be between Lichmore's point, he means Lichmere point, which is uh, all the way up on the top right, in the mouth of the Cambridge River, besides these I have been and marked out three places between Sewell's Point and our lines on Roxbury Neck for works to be thrown up. Uh, Washington had at least these two three-gun batteries built along the river. Um, it's, you know, for Washington, it's really not a fort, um, but it is a um, very strategic point. According to a 19th century history of Cambridge, these uh, commanded the river down to Leachmere's Point. And uh, though historically three cannon would have occupied the site, those currently on site were added much later in, in commemoration. All right, next slide. So this shows a recreated earthworks with sharpened timbers protruding from it at the Yorktown, Virginia battlefield. Um, there were numerous, numerous earthworks like this one, like the ones at Fort Washington Park, constructed throughout the American Revolution by both armies. Um, soldiers and laborers would dig in the ground. Uh, they would create a dry moat and then throw the dirt up to create a rampart. Um, and outside of that moat, they might place tangled tree branches um, or sharpened pieces of timber into the wall so that they were creating multiple barriers for any attacking troops in addition to the cannon and musket fire that they'd be under. So since historic preservation, you know, especially of relatively humble places like this one was not a priority for the fledgling United States after the revolution, all but one of the fortifications the Continental Army built during the siege of Boston were either built or plowed over. And that makes Fort Washington here in Cambridge, the oldest surviving fortification from the Revolutionary War. Um, the battery survived for a number of reasons you may hear about next, um, including the 19th century preservation efforts of the Dana family uh, in laws of the Longfellows. So last slide. Um, finally, this is an image of the Longfellow House Library. It's got books, it's got Victorian accoutrements. Um, Washington negotiated an end to the siege of Boston and a British exit from the city in March of 1775. So um, just less than six months after Fort Washington was built. Um, but it continued to be a strategic point. By April, Washington and the people who he enslaved and his paid staff were on their way to their next headquarters. The siege of Boston had ended, but the era of the revolution was clearly just getting underway. So historic sites like Longfellow House and like Fort Washington offer a really special opportunity, I think, to grapple with our country's historic triumphs and contradictions and injustices where they really, really happened. Um, and so I hope that you'll both get a chance to visit both of these sites to dig in deeper. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you very much. So I will stop share and then Charlie Sullivan is up next. If you'd like to start now. Hi, I'm Charlie Sullivan. I'm director of the Cambridge Historical Commission. And uh, I'm gonna go right to the uh, entertainment here. Oops, I uh, need to be enabled uh, to share my screen, please. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you, Emily. Um, I, I'm not I'll try not to repeat what you said, but this is a, a broader version of the same Pella map of 1777 that shows you the strategic uh, situation for the American Army, which was headquartered around Cambridge Common uh, on the on the right, the big uh, blue circle, and then the British were on in Boston um, with fortifications on Boston Neck and occupied Charlestown and B Bunker Hill. Uh, over to the neck. Uh, there were a whole series of major and minor forts, um, uh, Prospect Hill and Winter Hill at the top and Somerville, and then uh, 
uh, Lechmere Point and the, the blue circle in the middle, and then some minor forts that were intended to uh, uh, discourage the British from trying to sail up the Charles uh, to attack the American Army headquarters at Cambridge, at, at basically at Harvard Square, uh, the, the village that um, uh, constituted Cambridge at that time. So Fort Washington, the three-gun battery, was one of, of at least four uh, small small batteries that were situated along the river, which was tidal, of course. And so there probably wasn't much danger because most of the British force, uh, the British Navy were composed of frigates uh, that couldn't navigate above Charlestown. Uh, Longboats would have been a danger, but local knowledge of tides would have been a concern. Uh, as you can see, the Fort Washington was at the edge of of dry ground at the edge of a salt marsh, uh, just where the river narrowed. Um, this area was the throat of the river was covered more thoroughly by um, a fort at cottage, on elevated ground across in Brookline at Cottage Farm. So this is how these fortifications looked to the British from uh, Charlestown, from the, the Citadel on, at Bunker Hill. Uh, Leechburg Point is at the left and you can just see this line of, of earthworks here. Uh, there's another, uh, I think this is Prospect Hill, um, or no, that's the hill where McLean Asylum was built later. There's another fortification there. Fort Washington is off in the distance up to Charles River Valley, but uh, these were not um, like, like fortified castles. These were, as Emily showed, just earthworks. So um, all of this area of east, the eastern part of Cambridge was really un undeveloped, completely, almost completely unpopulated at the end of the 18th century, but the construction of the first bridge to Boston in 1793 opened up turnpike roads and villages uh, across the undeveloped parts of Cambridge in Cambridge Port in Green here, East Cambridge uh, in 1809. Um, but the lower part of, of Cambridge Port towards Magazine Beach was simply a dead end. Um, the only economic activity here was the powder magazine, uh, salt marsh hay gathering. Uh, this not very accurate map shows the future location of Brookline Street and the BU Bridge in 1850. And until then, this whole area was kind of a dead end. Uh, highly isolated Putnam Avenue does not exist. Um, Putnam Avenue comes across the edge of the marsh and out to, um, to, to about Fort Washington, but doesn't exist until much later. Um, it, be that as it may, this entire area below Central Square was owned by the Dana family, the descendants of Judge Francis Dana, who was an investor on the West Boston Bridge. Um, his highly uh, optimistic uh, offspring subdivided a, um, a low hill at the southern part of, of Cambridge Port, known as Pine Grove, because we assume there were there were pine trees on this hill, this low drumlin. Um, the Danas, um, of course, Francis Dana had been the first American ambassador to um, to Russia, um, or tried to be, um, and um, they were very closely associated with the, the patriotic cause. So. Uh, they found this derelict fort um, on their territory and set it aside in their subdivision um, as Washington Square and laid out house lots along Alston Street, uh, Erie Street, um, what became, uh, let's see, uh, no, Erie is above. This is the future Putnam Avenue um, in 1838. And this was anticipating the market by decades. Uh, this um, project did not um, proceed. Here's a map uh, drawn in uh, almost 10 years later. Uh, the fort is um, in that green circle. Uh, the Pine Grove subdivision is in this on this drumlin, uh, but there are only a handful of houses that have been built here 10 years later. Um, in 1854, by 1854, the uh, uh, Grand Junction Branch Railroad had been bought, uh, built across Cambridge Port to the wharves in East Boston. Uh, that cut right across the uh, Washington Square property, uh, actually took off a corner of it. 
and uh, probably did not help the um, future of this uh, residential suburb, which although it looks busy here because of the numbers on the lots, if you look carefully, there's uh, one house close to the fort, uh, scattered houses here and there, and only until you get over to Pearl Street is there much uh, activity by 1854. Um, this also shows you the situation uh, alongside the salt marsh. And of course, salt marshes flood at least monthly, uh, right up to the fort and in uh, uh, times in king tides, um, this area was pretty much inundated, um, even the house lots. So it's no wonder that no one wanted to build too close to the Charles before it was dammed in 1909. The Danas uh, gave the property to the city of Cambridge in 1857 and secured a, a state appropriation of $2,000 to enclose the, the uh, property with an ornamental cast iron fence. And the state donated the three cannon, which were placed in the earthworks. Uh, so here in 1873, uh, you can see it is still an isolated situation. The, the railroad right away has taken some of the port of the uh, park property. Uh, open water is still close by and development is um, is sketchy at best, but that was not going to last. Uh, beginning in 1878, uh, John Reardon uh, was, uh, established a soap factory immediately south of Fort Washington, which is at the top in this um, Sanborn map of 1885 and uh, built houses uh, for his workers across Waverly Street on the, the west side of Waverly Street. And this is the inception of Greasy Village, uh, a topic of conversation at an earlier uh, History Cambridge um, uh, event. So Reardon's uh, soap factory was a major factor on the landscape, both uh, physically uh, looming over Fort Washington Park, but also because making soap, as you can imagine, involves, as you know, involves boiling uh, animal remains and fats uh, and is a highly noxious process. So um, the Greasy Village name, uh, which probably was you know, what outsiders call this neighborhood of a factory and factory housing, um, uh, persisted through the 1950s when all of those houses were finally removed. Um, the fort um, it was the object of attention from children and children were widely blamed for the derelict condition that, that the Daughters of the American Revolution found it at the beginning of the 20th century. The Hannah Winthrop chapter uh, documented conditions at the park, um, documented the derelict cannon, um, the fence at this time was still pretty much intact, but uh, so it was really a landscaping project that the city uh, funded uh, to grade and seed the, um, the lawn um, and lay out paths, as you see in the 1903 plan on the, the right. So jumping ahead though, uh, this area uh, did, did not prosper as a residential part of Cambridge, but as an industrial uh, and uh, warehouse and distributing uh, section of Cambridge. The, the Boston and Albany took over the Grand Junction branch. There were four tracks uh, running through the, the entire uh, uh, circuit of Cambridge Port with spur tracks to service industries uh, everywhere, a spur track running up to the Neco factory on Mass Avenue. A uh, factory making lally columns, Reardon and Sons operating until the 1950s, Greasy Village across Waverly Street, but then other industries springing up in um, what the Danas hoped would be a, um, a residential neighborhood. 1947, um, uh, this is looking, uh, actually, this is the captions not correct. This is looking north. Um, Waverly Street would be to the left. Um, you can see that the grade has been raised here. The bottom rail of the fence is now buried. Uh, the fence is beginning to deteriorate. Um, the, um, uh, the cannon are sinking back into the ground, but the parts of the fence are starting to disappear. And the reason is that the St. Johnsbury Trucking Company of Vermont has established a trucking terminal on the west side of, of uh, Waverly Street where Greasy Village's houses were. 
and they have obtained from the city the right to pave uh, the area behind the park between the park on park land, uh, but between the, the fenced in park and the railroad tracks. So uh, St. Johnsbury is occupying the lots on the north and south of the fort on the west side where their terminal is, and they're using the back of the fort to circulate. Um, this is how the fort began to was looking by 1977. Uh, the maneuvering trucks were constantly hitting the fence and knocking it down. Um, this was a uh, disaster um, in the making. The trucks, uh, as uh, trailers got longer, uh, trucks could not maneuver into the trucking terminal without damaging the fence. Um, so uh, this is the bicentennial period. The Cambridge Historical Commission stepped in and took on the project of restoring uh, the fence. Uh, some strategic decisions were made. The, um, the trucking terminal was considered to be um, a fact of life. And so the key decision was that the, uh, the front cast iron fence, the, the, um, the west elevation facing Waverly Street was moved back, um, uh, I think, uh, 20 feet um, back to a new line. Um, we did not move the the eastern uh, line, but we did what we restored or we intended to restore the fence on that original line. Um, so that was key. Um, we salvaged, we had to demolish the entire fence, um, the, what was left of it. Uh, we were only able to salvage, I think, a dozen or so of the cannon posts. Uh, this is one in the process of being restoration, being restored. The uh, ornate bottom rail of the fence uh, had completely disappeared. There were no intact sections of that. So we had a wooden foundry pattern carved uh, uh, like the original must have done uh, by by a craftsman. And, um, and then... Um, we began the reconstruction project. Uh, this is the new buffer strip, a uh, series of bollards that were installed. The old fence is being, has being removed. Um, the f a f new cast iron uh, components are being, um, are being uh, cast in a foundry in Chelmsford. Um, all new cannon posts, halberd poles, uh, all of the, the all of those components. And then on the lower right, now you can see uh, the restored fence, the first installment of the restored fence. But ironically, St. Johnsbury trucking failed um, in 1980, and their uh, trucking terminal was reconstituted, rebuilt as Fort Washington Research Park by American Science and Engineering in 1981. So, Charlie, hi, just, yes, sorry, just I, I need to finish up. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. Um, so with a brief interlude of a dog park in 2007, um, the, par the restoration was finished in 1989. Uh, we recovered from the dog park. The Fort uh, Park now looks, has been irrigated. It's um, in better shape than it's ever been before. And as for the future, it's a now an historic district and has been since 1981. And the zoning code, now uh, provides for residential on the, the former trucking lots and uh, with a 45 foot height limit. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you. All right, yeah, thank you very much. This gave a very good overlook at everything over the past. Um, yeah, just very good overviews. So thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen again. And I'll do my presentation next. Where to go? Hold on just one second. All right, sorry, here we go. All righty. So, so I will be talking a little bit more about um, sort of what Charlie touched on at some point, but sort of the um, early 1900s era of this of the park and talking about um, these, this really interesting set of oral histories I listened to um, that really show the daily lives of people who lived in the neighborhood 
um, in the early 1900s. So I listened to this set of oral histories conducted by um, a Simmons student, Barbara Slavin, who interviewed her mother and three other um, Cambridge Port and sort of Fort Washington area um, residents who were each born in the 1910s. And so, so these oral histories really showed the daily lives of um, just sort of like children, but also their families in the 1910s, 1920s. And um, I really enjoyed listening to these oral histories because I think listening to and learning about the daily lives of people who lived in these um, sort of so close to these historic locations and that had such big sort of historic significance. I think it's interesting to then look at the daily lives of the people who lived there afterwards and see how they interact with the history and sort of what um, what that piece of history became for then sort of like the everyday people who lived there after the revolution or something like that. Um, so as we sort of touched on the this neighborhood had a good amount of factories. So like the Reardon soap factory that's gave the greasy village name and then um, like the Lally column factory. So it was very much um, like a working class area where the people who lived in the neighborhood also worked in the neighborhood. And so um, uh, like, so the soap factory, the construction factories, um, the people who lived there, the owners of the factories also owned a lot of the buildings that the um, residents would live in. And so the residents worked, lived there, and then were also able to just sort of get a lot of their community and also like necessities like groceries and things in the area as well. Um, and so I, one of the interesting things in the oral histories I listened to was listening to how they, um, a lot of the people remembered these fun like songs or tunes that a lot of the vendors who would come through the area would sing when they were um, sort of like out advertising their goods and things like that. And so um, these vendors would come through the park or come through the streets and um, call out for like fruits and vegetables or fish or soap or also services like knife sharpening or laundry. Um, and so it was really interesting to kind of see the, the different necessities that you could get by these vendors who would walk through the park or walk through the street and see, sing these songs and you could, the people would come out and sort of get what they needed and right close to where they lived and where they worked. Um, and so with this sort of being able to get all of your necessities and all of a lot of what you needed right in where you lived also lent itself to building a community of all the people who lived in Cambridgeport at the time. Um, and it also really showed the just, I mean, the power of community, but the, also the power of um, community like after immigration, because a lot of the people who lived in the area at the in the early 1900s era were um, immigrants from Europe who often would have to leave a good amount of their family behind. And often Ireland, the, the people who um, were interviewed for these oral histories, most of them were from Ireland. And so they would talk about their aunts who were still there or their family members who had come over to the US. And so um, because so many immigrants had to leave their family or leave their community behind when they moved, then they had this shared experience that they could all relate to when they arrived and where they lived in Cambridgeport. And specifically, one of the um, women in the oral history was talking about how when people, maybe people lived in the same county in Ireland and then arrived and, and lived in Cambridgeport, and then their neighbors were from the same county. And so they sort of had to leave their families behind, but then they became quote unquote brothers and sisters again through the community and through their neighbors and being able to kind of connect with people who maybe had lived near them um, and then had to leave family behind, but then sort of met again in Cambridgeport. And so I thought that was a really interesting way of looking um, at sort of like the power of community through um, immigration and sort of the community that formed. Um, and so one of the main results of Oh, actually, I have a fun anecdote as well for um, 
I, one of the, a few of the people in the oral histories talked about how their families would sort of get together and always have tea at the table ready for whenever their neighbor or their aunt or their sister would stop by. But all the, because the, they were really talking about their childhood in these oral histories, they would say like, oh, well, it was, I would come home and like the table would be full, but then I was always annoyed because I would have to do all the dishes afterwards because like I would be, I would come home, my aunt and my my family would be having tea, but then I was the one who had to do the dishes afterwards. And so it's sort of sweet listening to people talk about their childhood of like, here's my parents making these connections, but I had to then do the dishes afterwards. It was just like sort of a funny anecdote. But um, so because of this community, it also lent itself well to all the children really becoming close and very close knit as well. Um, and so you can see in this photo, all these children here sort of on the earthworks. And then here is another photo from the same era, like 1920s, looking at the earthworks as well. And um, a lot of the children or a lot of the people in the oral histories would talk about as children would see these earthworks as like mountains because they were sort of like in the middle of the city, but they would see these big mounds in the park as mountains because they seem so big to a child. And so he would talk about sledding down these mountains in the winter and then playing on them in the summer and playing hide and seek and really just enjoying the park um, and really using it as a place for all the kids to get together. Um, and so it was a place where the children would play with their siblings or bring all their the neighborhood kids that they're babysitting. And so it really just like became a place for all the children to play and kind of just like be children together. Um, and so one of the funny things that kind of resulted as, I mean, as a result of all these children playing together was, you can see here's a different view of the park, this um, flagpole right in the center. There is like this legend or sort of mystery or rumor that a lot of the children spread that um, George Washington's horse from the Revolutionary War was buried underneath this flagpole in the park. And there's not really any like truth to it or like evidence really, but it was just sort of, I thought it was an interesting way that the children connected this huge event that had happened, the Revolutionary War and like knowing the history, how they connected that such like significant piece of history then to their, their own present day and say, well, we know Washington was here and we know he's not buried here, but maybe his horse is buried here for whatever reason they, <laughs> this rumor began. Um, and so it seemed like just a very like sort of interesting and like childlike way to connect such a significant piece of history to then their present day and make up this sort of fun mystery legend to kind of connect the revolution to their own lives. Um, yeah, so that is my section of the presentation. And then I will hand it over to Madeline who has presentation as well. So I'll just leave the screen sharing up here. Great. Can you hear me, Betsy and everyone? Yes. Uh, oh, great. Well, good evening and thank you all. And wonderful to see Charlie after all these years. And um, his period of putting the fence back and getting it restored was a, I believe at that time there was a rule, whether it was Cambridge or the state that 1% of the budget was required for art. And I had a friend working at um, the art set uh, in Cambridge doing graphics because there was no interweb then to find out about art calls. You had to have friends in the know. And she called me up and said, there's something going on here. You might be interested, come to the meeting. She knew that I had just decided to either go tap dancing or learn to cut steel and had chosen to learn to cut steel to get away from my two little children at the time and have an evening off twice a week. And my dental agency at the time was also the um, school committee woman and her husband was a reenactor. And when she found out 
that I was cutting steel, because you tell the person who cleans your teeth everything, even though they can't understand a word. She said, look, for his Christmas present, could you possibly cut out a Minuteman now that you've learned to cut steel? And I said, sure. And um, went off to a bunch of reenactments and took photographs of him and all the other fellows. And then my friend called me up and said, there's an opportunity for art in Cambridge. And it turned out to be Minutemen. And I'd already cut out one in steel. It was a couple feet high. So I came to the meeting and I made a proposal and I had, you know, a very fresh certificate of being able to cut and weld and got the, got the gig to do life-size cut steel drawings of reenactors, real men. Those faces are real, I didn't invent them. The posture and the body language and the outfits are all a little less, less pretty than the ones in the illustration that we saw earlier. But these were guys who sewed their, made their buttons, sewed their uniforms, you know, had long rifles made um, to order for, the, for their rein, reenacting. And I took a photograph of a man carrying a water bucket um, at an encampment and put him near the railroad track where the river or the wetlands would have been coming in at the time. But the project went beyond Minutemen. It was to kind of talk to at least two of the periods of the fort, the Minutemen and the DAR when they turned the fort into a park. And when the berms were no longer um, places to hide, but places to sit and have tea and have children and talk and walk dogs and be, be um, celebratory. So um, the woman who posed for me for that sculpture lived next to the metal shop. And she was a beautiful Irish woman, which would have been appropriate. And she said she'd love to pose and pretend to be a DAR. And she got a great big hat at a, at a flea market and some outfit. And she sat down on a hill for me and I photographed her and then I cut out her portrait. So that was the the origin of those pieces. And um, I mean, it was just a crazy combination of, I think I'm gonna to learn to cut steel. I am an artist, I've always been an artist. I make, I taught school in art and children and animations and made paintings and prints and drawings. Went to Smith and studied art and wanted to do sculpture, but um, ended up discovering that cutting steel was cheaper than framing paintings. And so that's where I ended up for quite a while. So there you see the three pictures. Okay, next slide. And these are the reenactment photographs that I took that I based those images on. Okie doke. Next one. And here's, here's one of my original drawings. I still have it. Um, I was 35 at the time. I mean, this was what, 87? Charlie, and um, I'm 74 and nearly 75 now. So I, I was, I guess I've been a hoarder. I still have, and I had a lot of models that I cut out in steel and I gave them to the group at Cambridge Arts. And, and so they had them in their windowsills and on the walls. I don't know where they are now, but um, we can go to the next one. There I am. How does a 35 year old end up in a metal yard, gas axing sheets of steel that she's kneeling on while her children are in school? Well, it happened. And the pieces um, were my great delight to do. And um, a friend of mine came to photograph me and Barbara Allen Marshall, I appreciate it so much because she did a beautiful job. And that the Cavaliers in Acton just had had artists work there before, so they didn't even blink when I asked them if I could come and make some sculptures and they didn't know me from anybody. But they said, "How? where do you want your table and let's build it for you. And I just went out in the yard to work on my order of steel, which Cambridge was good to pay for. Okie doke, next one. So there you can see some of the results, the um, triplet in front 
is a small model, the proposal for the big one that's now in the park. Um, and I, I gave that to the group, I believe, because I don't have it anymore. And then two of the three big ones are, are there in the yard and they would weld them to bases for me. And, and then they would crane, big, big truck with a crane, bring them into the park for me and, and lower them into um, footings that this, the Cambridge group had set up where the placement of everything was near the fences and near the edges of the park so it wouldn't intrude in baseball or softball or dog walking. They liked the idea of cut steel flat drawings because it didn't intrude into the park and it fit the budget. Okay, what's next? So there we are with the crane and you see Daniel Cavalier's name on the door of the truck in the science building and the DAR getting lowered into her footing. Yeah, okay. And I wanna say that this installation of sculpture in Cambridge led to all sorts of things. I, because of that group of cut steel drawings, I was invited to propose for the first 9-11 memorial in this country in the town of Whitensville, Massachusetts. I now live actually in Dudley in the home of the Nipmuc. And um, I love so much that we, we've heard tonight about more than two periods in tandem, the DAR and the fort that we've heard of the Native Americans, that we've heard the, the fortification where they were hiding and, and then the Irish coming along and living and working in the factories and sitting on the mountains and sledding and that the DAR and then finally Charlie and his group restoring it and families coming back to beautifully watered lawns and so many periods where community was the first thing that happened in the beginning with the indigenous people. And that's where it's sort of ending up now. But this particular piece is the first 9-11 memorial permanent one in the country and it's in Whitensville. And it was the cut steel style from real people, photographs of real people, the, the police chief and the fire chief that they saw the one in, in Cambridge and they asked me to make them something in Whitensville. So thank you, Cambridge, you've set me up. So I, what's next, anything else? Well, I've gone into three dimensions and if you ever go around the um, Federal Reserve Bank near South Station, you'll see my 10 foot giraffe made of scraps that came out of the big dig I went down to a big metal yard and pulled all the scraps and put them back in Boston as a giraffe and an ostrich and a Mr. Bojangles. I've worked for a living all my life. I've worked full time in technology and, um, but always made my art. And I worked at the Federal Reserve for 12 years, many long hours, but I've always made my art. And as my daughter said, well, mom, there's a reason you work there. And sure enough, one day they called me up after I'd gone and said, do you have anything big? We need something big. We're trying to make the place friendly. So um, that might be the last slide. Is that it? Yes, that was the last slide. I just want to say I was fresh out of, you know, um, art school. I mean, not art school, but going to the welding and, and, and steel cutting class which in a, in a way is kind of in line with all the industrial you know, tone of the place, the park. And so making those sculptures out of cut steel is probably in, in line, not only with the fencing and the land, but with the, with the folk who live there and the jobs they had. So thank you very much for inviting me to talk and tell my story. Yeah, thank you very much. Right, so we're done with all of our speakers. Thank you, everybody. I feel like that was a very good overview of so many different eras and so many different aspects of the park. So yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat if you're, um, or you can also do the little raise hand emoji thingy and we can call on you, whatever anyone has any questions. <laughs>
I, I see one note that says historians are grateful for hoarders and um, I'm, I'm grateful for historians. Thank you. <laughs> I had a question, Charlie. Was there any discussion of trying to get more land back from the park that was taken away? Uh, the land that was taken away was um, taken by the railroad and um, it is almost impossible to retrieve land that's been taken by eminent domain by a railroad. I mean, just, just from the way that railroads are protected uh, within their rights of way. So yeah, no, um, um, we haven't done that. Although there is a corner of the park that's uh, traversed by the spur track that went up to Neko and um, that apparently was never transferred legally. They just had a right of way. I mean, a, a permission to lay a track, and that that is still part of the park with a track on it. Great, um, Brian. If you'd like to ask your question, feel free. Um, yeah, Brian Campbell. I was um, wondering. Um, if um, you did in your research any um, information about the um, three cannons, I know that they're, of course, from um, Governor's Island, that's now Logan Airport. But um, I've looked around many places and I found ones that are similar to that um, 18 pound, the same. It looks identical to the ones in Stonington, um, Connecticut, that were uh, part of a um, battle in the War of 1812. Um, it's called the Glorious um, 10th, August 10th, 1814, where those cannon were used in Stonington to repel the British from an invasion. Um, so my question would be, is anybody um, done any um, work on the origin, exactly where those things were cast and where they came from? I think we have some information about the cannon, Brian, but I don't have it at my fingertips. If you want to email me, csullivan at cambridgema.gov or, or get in touch with Marika, um, we'll get back to you. Thank you. I wonder if Betsy or Charlie, you wanna to touch on any archeology span that was done there? I know there was some done, but. Yeah, um, we did do an archeological survey in the 1980s. Um, uh, we hired, hired an archeologist who laid out a, a, a set of test pits on a grid pattern across the entire park. Um, we, we didn't find any structures. There's no, there was no magazine that we could find, no powder magazine. Um, and that may not be surprising. I mean, this, this fort may never have actually received cannon in the, in the first place, um, uh, but um, it was a, you know, very out of the way, even in Washington's time. So uh, as far as we could tell, the earthworks, the core of the earthworks consist of marsh soil uh, that would have been dug up from from the riverside of the fortifications, just as in Emily's slide of the, the earthwork. Um, so we were able to confirm that that was their earthworks were not composed of later fill. Yeah, I was looking at the archaeological, um, there is a report and yeah, it's interesting now that even it's sort of kept and we had this whole Zoom event looking at the history of it when really it's like there not much evidence that it was ever actually used for actual cannon fire or anything like that. But it's interesting the history of it has remained so much that kind of yeah, I don't know. All right. Even by 19, 1857, when the Danas gave this, it, it was all the others uh, were in the process of disappearing if they hadn't mm -hmm. already. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad one was saved so we can keep learning from the history of it and seeing how it kind of progresses. 
So we're waiting. Yeah. Um, Betty, if you have your question, you're welcome to ask it. Uh, just a comment, really. Uh, it was kind of shocking to see the disrepair it had fallen in. Um, and I have a feeling, but for um, it being declared a historic district, we would not be appreciating it today, um, especially the the location. I mean, it's prime location for a lab space or anything else. Um, so kudos to the Historic Commission for taking the initiative and getting it done. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. It, it's driving by it today. It's there's, I don't know, so much being sort of built up around it. And so it's nice to have a little designated park spot that has some history attached to it as well. Yeah, Brian, if you have another question as well. Brian Campbell again. I was just wondering if um you could say anything about. Bernard Rudolph, who the um, square is named after. Thank you. Yeah, Bernie Rudolph was, um, I knew Bernie. He was a, a longtime Cambridge resident, a real patriot. He made sure that we always had a flag flying, um, even when the park was being taken apart. Um, he was a great advocate for the restoration um, that we were due actually because of the bicentennial. Um, freed up funds for projects like this. I mean, the city of Cambridge had uh, really let it go, but the bicentennial brought in outside money and interest that encouraged us to get the park, to start the restoration. All right. And nobody's asked about the trees uh, that if I may add, um, when we started, there were still a number of American elms uh, that had survived into the 1970s, but they they all died of Dutch elm disease before wow. 1980. And so the trees in the park now are Zelkovas, uh, which are a, um, a variant that were intended to, they're an elm, but they don't have the tall branching vase-like shape of American elms. But they filled out and been quite successful, I think. Um, they're now about 45 years old. All right. Well, if anyone has any questions, we're also, oh, Marika, did you have I'm one? sorry, I'm full of questions. It's just such a fascinating topic and everyone is so great. Um, Madeline, I love your art um, in the space and- um, um, Sorry, I'm just, there's just some echoes, so I'm just making sure to mute everybody. I, I guess I'm, I'm curious what the perspective of seeing the art over, you know, now versus when you did it. Like, it, I don't know the last time you were in the park, but how do you feel when you see it now? Well, I feel a lot better about it having heard the full story from, you know, indigenous to um, neighborhoods, because those sculptures were based on real people with real you know whiskers and you know hairdos and bald heads and you know worn hands they were men who worked as plumbers and um, furnace fixers and you know selectmen and went off and pr pretended to be in the revolution but they pretended to be real people who were starting something that was unknown and so I feel really glad to hear about all the people who've been there, the oyster eaters and the fishermen on up to the lawn stro strollers today. And I'm glad that Charlie and the group that asked me to do this took this project the way I proposed it because I've always been a humanist. I've always wanted real faces and eyeballs and gestures, the hopefully the other works I showed you, you know, are evidence of that. But um, so it's a thrill that, you know, you can't compete with your younger self, all you young people. Someday you'll know that you'll understand what I'm saying. But it, I did something right. 
<laughs> and it's lasted. So thank you very much, Cambridge <laughs> and Charlie. It's good to see you. Absolutely. We, we still have the butterfly catcher in our backyard, Madeline. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> wow. Right. Um, I have a question. Yeah, Can sure. We... Yeah, and then I'll call on the next person as well. I couldn't hear. Oh yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So do we know anything about the soldiers who must have been stationed there? Did they live near it, on it, in it? Um, do we have any uh, reports of any activity that they did um, when they left, when they came, when they left? Anything about the actual people who manned it? Um, we don't. Emily, do you have anything? No. Because that would be, um, I mean, we have these pretend people, but it would be so interesting to know who the real people were, you know. Yeah. Many of them um, were. You know, the, the one thing, about the only thing that was written at the time was uh, George Washington wrote that he had ordered these three batteries thrown up in case the bay got froze. And I think um, the idea was maybe it was a defense against longboats going up the Charles, but also uh, the Charles River did occasionally freeze over and um, enough to be able to walk across. Uh, and I think these little forts down in that part of Cambridgeport may have been put up with that in mind. I mean, that's what Washington is saying. Mm -hmm. In which case, you know, it's wintertime, you saw in the, in the pencil sketch from Bunker Hill, that there were no trees. I mean, all of this was open land. So if the British made a move, they would have, you could have seen them coming. And I think sent directed troops down quickly to, to man these forts. I, we, we never found archeological evidence of a, a barracks um, either. I mean, there's no, no structures at all. Mm -hmm. um, so there might've been tent, people living in tents, but it's unknowable at this point, I think. Thanks. Thank you, Emily, if you do have to leave shortly. Um, and Simha, if you'd like to ask your question as well. Charles, uh, what would you like to see happen on either side of the park? As we all know, MIT owns that property and it's um, designated in the zoning ordinance for residential uses. Uh, how would you like to see that uh, those uh, sites adjacent to the park develop? Well, um, you may not, folks may not know that Bob Simha was planning director at MIT for decades and decades, uh, including during the period when we established the historic district uh, to include MIT land on both sides of the park uh, and a view corridor out to the river. Um, so MIT is now building dormitories. Um, they've um, graciously pulled back those dormitories so they're outside the historic district and outside the, they maintain a view towards the river. You never see the river anymore, but it's out there and you see the sky. Um, the, we arranged to have the zoning um, amended to require, um, to allow only residential um, or dormitory use on those vacant lots either side of the park with a 45 foot height limit uh, compared to 60 feet either side of the district. So the, the idea was to set up the zoning to fulfill the ideal of the Danas, that it be the park be the center, a residential center of a residential square. And so someday we hope MIT will, I'm sure they will, they'll get, they'll get there. Uh, they're close. Um, but well, that's keep the urging them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so do I, um, to yes. keep thinking creatively about what they can do there. But uh, we wanted to make sure that the, the fort, the park would not be overwhelmed by high rises directly on the, on the, on the landscaped area, that it would have a residential scale. So we'll get there. Amen. Thank you for your question. This is also a very good plug for our next event, which is, um, being at the physical park and sort of asking questions about what people think, how the park should evolve, what should happen, how people interact with the park. So that's just a great segue and plug for our next event as well.
Um, but thank you to everybody who came out and for our speakers, and then also for just everybody who can visit, ask questions. So thank you very much. And we'll be sending out a survey afterwards. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or comments, anything like that. Um, so I'll be sending that out shortly. Um, yeah, so thank you again to everybody who came to visit. Oh, and also thank you to right. the Society of the Cincinnati for um, funding the grant that funded this whole event and series of events. So yes, thank you again. Great. See you soon.